Hello, I'm John Bradbury from the EMA People Experience team. Today is, a, is another podcast where we're exploring the dynamic workplace. In other words, the, the changes that have happened in terms of the uh, place and how and when pe- people do work, um, really that's been brought on by the, the pandemic and changes that have been made since January 2020. And again, sort of shifts this, this year in 2022. Um, I'm really pleased today that uh, the guest I have is a very experienced H- HR professional uh, in terms of hold senior roles in a variety of New Zealand organisations and na- nowadays works as a consultant working across a wide variety of organisations throughout New Zealand. Um, so the guest is Andrew Steele or Steely as he's known to, to many of us um, and um I, th- I think really I should hand over to, to Steely to introduce himself. <laughs> oh, thanks, John. Um, it's very kind. Yeah, a- Andrew Steele. Steely, most people call me that. Uh, I've been involved in HR for a reasonable period of time, 30 plus years, as John indicated, a number of uh, organisations in the UK, New Zealand and Australia. And I currently run a little uh, boutique consultancy business um, supporting businesses actually in New Zealand and some clients in Australia and in the Pacific um, helping them with thinking about um, the future of HR, people management and, and the like. So lots of fun, lots of fantastic clients, and I'm very fortunate. Very good, Steely. That's that's fantastic. So being able to give us a little bit of a snip of a look outside New Zealand as well, which yeah. I think will be helpful. Um, so, you know, when, when you think about that and you think about these these changes that have happened in terms of what we're terming the dynamic workplace, the sort of flexible, hybrid part-time working, four-day working week and so on. Um, you know, what are the big trends that sort of stand out to you in terms of changes? Look, I, I think people are really challenged about um, thinking how do they operate their business efficiently, effectively with the right people, the right talent on board and how, how what does that mean for them in terms of is it a four-day week? Is that going to work for them? Is it a hybrid and if, what is a hybrid in their world? I mean, if you're a manufacturing operation, and so my clients are, that's really hard to operate a four-day week given their capital investment cost. But for others in more office-bound in the IT startup sector that I support, you know, that's just part and parcel of what they've been doing anyway. To them, it's natural and it's um, uh, not something any, anything new. So look, uh, yeah, it, 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 it's horses for courses. It varies by sector. It varies by maturity. It varies by leadership style. So, uh, you know, we were talking earlier around about the different approaches to leaders. Some like a wee bit of people in the office, that presentism and, and people seeing people around. Others don't really care too much as long as the outcome is driven uh, to, the, you know, to meet the objective set. So there's no one right answer. For example, one of my clients is using a, a, a three to one model. So three days um, where they are out of the office, two days in the office, and one, one of the two days have to be um, that the whole team has to be there. So, you know, stuff like that. They've come up with different frames to kind of get what they want and get and satisfy the needs of the employees as well. Right. So, I mean, I mean, straight away there, there's so, so many things that you've sort of highlighted in terms of uh, the difference by, by industry, uh, the challenges that there often are in terms of getting acceptance in your organisation for changes in the work practice and the sort of pressure that it puts on, on sort of managerial and leadership skills as well. Mm. Yeah, very much so. Leading in a, in a remote world is quite different, um, especially for those who have not adapted to it or been used to it. Uh, and it takes different... Uh, processes. So how how do you engage people in an online world who might be remote, who might be working different time zones? So when I did work for a, a multinational, it was part and parcel. You had to adjust to that different situation. I had people who um, were doing work for me in three or four different time zones. And from a New Zealand perspective, it was quite different uh, to think like that. So, But you adapted. And those were the days where we didn't have uh, Zoom or Teams or some of the modern technologies, even some of the um, uh, innovations that have come up with uh, Mural and all the other Miro and all those other kind of things that are out there to kind of help engage and innovate. So um, it does take a different mindset. Oh, de- definitely. And, you know, with, with that, 
comes sort of change in terms of interaction between individuals in, in the team as well around what's the dynamics, how do you, people talk about is collaboration something that's harder to do when people are remote or is it easier to do when people are remote? Do you have a take on that? Yeah, I look, I, I, I personally, I like a whiteboard. And people who know me will, will laugh because I naturally have a tendency to go up and draw things on the whiteboard and mock up a model. I'm a visual per, visual learner and visual person. Others aren't like that. And, and again, adapting to the different learning and, and styles of individuals is hard. Um, I think Adam Grant um, talked recently around that, uh, that innovation can happen anywhere. It doesn't have to be face to face. And that's his uh, take on where we're heading. I'm not 100% certain about that yet, to be honest, because you know, maybe I'm a bit old and maybe I'm a bit old fashioned, but um, uh, I can certainly see potentially where it might head. Um, so look, no firm view on it. I think it's um, organisational uh, differences will play out, but there are tools out there. There are methodologies to enable you to do that. And and I, and I do think it's um, it enables, especially in a global context, to pick people with the best of talent from around the world. They don't have to be necessarily sitting in your home location. And I, that, that's something that really is exciting, I think, for businesses, especially from a New Zealand perspective, where we are quite a distance away from some of the centres of talent and expertise. Oh, definitely. And I mean, organisations are very pressured at the moment in time, just trying to find skills. So many shortages be, being being reported. Um, so that sounds like a way that you're indicating there of maybe opening up the, the doors a wee bit in terms of finding talent beyond talent that's in New Zealand. A absolutely. Uh, one of the large consulting firms have uh, just released an article and they're calling it Fluid Talent. And that's thinking differently around the use of not just um, default position, we must employ a permanent or part-time employee who must be on site. It's thinking differently around use, using some of the talent marketplaces that are up, in the, you know, the Upworks, the uh, Catalans, and some of these products that are out there now where you can reach a far greater audience. It's thinking around about the use of consultants, contractors, um, the, the variety of options that are out there now in terms of sourcing talent. And it's especially important, I think, as this uh, next cluster of uh, millennial kind of people come into the workforce and they want to work differently and organisations have got to adapt to that. Definitely. I mean, so, I mean, you're giving us some quite big picture there, but I know you're working practically with many organisations as, as well. What, what are the sort of, what would be a really good example of the sorts of things that organisations are wrestling with that you've sort of helped them to navigate? I think a lot of it's uh, questioning them when they go to the default position I talked about before, oh, we need to employ somebody to do a job and asking the questions around, well, is it a full-time permanent job? Can it be done differently? Why haven't you thought about um, going online, uh, looking at Upwork? Or, uh, and that's easier for some jobs than others, obviously, you know, in a manufacturing hands-on environment. Uh, say some of my clients in the agri sector, the tech sector, that's just not possible. But I think it's beholden of anyone to uh, advising firms to actually make them think differently and ask those those questions and not just naturally go back to the old position. Oh, we need a, we need a person and we need them now. Because one of the other things too, I think with this talent shortage is organisations be very careful around who they bring into the uh, organisation and I get a sense with some of my clients because they do need that proverbial bum on seat that they are employ, employing anybody. Uh, and I think in a year or two's time, there'll be some regrettable decisions made. Um, and so I advise my clients to think hard before they make that really good uh, decision or, or about who they bring into their organisation. Right. So it sounds it sounds like um, you're using it as a platform, as it were, to challenge some of the, some of their thinking. A kind of you don't need to go back to January 2020. You know, perhaps the good old days weren't really always just the good old days. Um, and you know, with with this, um, what what sort of resistance do you get to that in organisations? Do you hear of organisations where people are very very adamant that they want to go back to how things were and uh, perhaps bring people back into the work for, for workplace. Yeah, to be fair, John, I have to say that the majority of my, you know, and I normally deal with say ten to fifteen clients um, on a regular basis at one time, and I'd have to say that not many of them are thinking like that. I think there has been 
quite a quantum shift in 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 thinking at, at uh, HR and more broadly at executive level and organizational level about how they operate for the future. So whilst they do want to go back to some of the things that happened in the past, I think that the momentum's changed a bit now and they are understanding that it can't be what it was. And that is certainly from the availability of talent, um, given you know the current job market, they just don't have that choice either. And I think they've been quite realistic about it. Okay, so it sounds like that challenge in the the job market is really helping to kind of concentrate concentrate minds, and you start to sound like uh, an HR professional who sees that as an opportunity rather than a, a a negative from an HR point of view. Like you're not saying HR work is getting really difficult because of this talent shortage. You should be saying like this is a real opportunity to do things some do things really well because business owners and senior leaders are going to be open to thinking differently. Yeah, look, I, I think um, there's two levels to that. One, for those organisations that do need someone to serve you a cup of tea, work in their tourism operation, it's quite different. Mm. So therefore, you need to think differently about how you attract them and how you retain them. So I was talking to a client uh, this week in that, in that sector who is struggling. You know, the labour rates have gone up. Um, they, they, they're a bit of a tighter margin business. They need to think differently. So what can they do that attracts and retains the people in that situation differently? So we were talking um, around the events they can organise, the other types of rewards they can reflect on, the, the framing around, you know, do they need them, you know, eight hours a day, five days, seven days a week? So just thinking differently around uh, their operations, a uh, whole lots of different ideas that we were just tossing around there. Um, but for those organisations that have the ability to uh, use global uh, platforms to bring in talent, say from marketing or for elements of um, uh, design work, you know, they need to be thinking differently, I think. And they, and, and they are, absolutely are. Very good. Very interesting. And, you know, a number of times in your answers, you've talked about the role of technology mm -hmm. within this. And there's technology um, that you, you mentioned specifically that um, can substitute for your whiteboard, for example, yeah, for yes. those of us in, in, a, in a room with you or in a virtual room with you, you still can access a whiteboard. Um, but moving away from sort of office jobs, um, what, what about the impact of technology on, you know, in manufacturing, for example, what, what sort of things do you see happening there? Yeah, look, I think it's always been coming um, in terms of AI robotics and the other kind of uh, um, ability to automate. And, you know, there are examples of where that is already happening quite a lot in, in New Zealand um, and certainly overseas. Uh, the Asian countries in particular are very strong on that. I think the labour market pressures and the ability to access uh, um, cost effective labour is, is, is going to challenge organisations and therefore they they need to start thinking about how do you use automation uh, technology to replace some of the things that people used to do, but you just can't find the people to do it. And that forward thinking uh, element. So yeah, a lot of the organizations I'm talking to um, are debating that, but only when the price is right for that automation. But you are seeing a lot, one organization I'm working with now are uh, looking at, um, uh, the, the 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 robotic process automation piece, um, thinking around about machine learning and AI technologies. So that's already on the cards, and over the next one to two years, that'll become a big part of where they're heading. Right. So that whole sort of advanced manufacturing, mm. um, the movements that are happening there, the changes that are happening there, and and is that something that for organisations that you would see related to? this whole sort of talent shortage demand for, for hybrid working? Is it something that starts to enable people to offer more flexible working patterns to people in jobs that maybe we think, well, someone definitely has to be there nine to five or, or beyond every day? Yeah, look, it's nothing new. If you think about some of the mining companies in Western Australia, they've been operating uh, uh, controlled, remote controlled trucks uh, and the likes for a number of years. Um, trains uh, in the Pilbara have been remoted for a while. So, you know, some of that's not new. Uh, and I, and one of the things New Zealand's got to get to grips with, in my mind, is that investment for, and, and get the benefit from it and think ahead. Um, we've probably been underspending and underinvesting in some of that, uh, that side of things. And we've got some great New Zealand companies who are doing some amazing stuff out there. Uh, the agri-tech sector, 
Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on there that uh, the latest TIN report talked about the massive investment in agri-tech. You know, it's, it's, and in some great minds out there looking to solve some of these problems. Yeah. Okay. This is this is this is an interesting area to consider, really, isn't it? Around this, you know, the, the, all these sort of moving parts in in mm. the workplace and with with the workforce and so forth. And I, I'm in lots of your answers. You seem to be talking about there were trends that are happening already that have been kind of accelerated and so forth. Um, have you ever known a time like this before in that? I can't remember what it was, how long it was you said you've been doing this, but, um, you know, a, a sort of this intensity of sort of change. Has it been like this before? Look, as indicated, John, I've been around and started work in the late 80s ahead of the uh, share market crash in New Zealand and the UK in the, in the 90s, seen the dot com bust and burst and, and uh, the GFC working for a financial services organisation. So I guess I've been party to a bit of this, but no, I, I don't think I've seen this um, coming together of, of talent shortages, immigration issues, a pandemic, um, changing technologies with lots of investment being chucked in certain fields. I don't, yeah, I don't think there has been something like this in my experiences from an HR perspective. And of course, HR people uh, you know, they're struggling a little in my mind to, fall, to find solutions uh, to, to all these problems they're facing. Uh, and, and you've seen it in some of the data I read yesterday, you know, something like 73% of Australian HR people are looking for another job. I think the last two or three years, in particular for health and safety and HR professionals, has been unbelievably difficult. Uh, the challenges of the unknown. And the unfortunate thing is I think that that's not going to stop and that's going to be the way forward. And so HR people need to think around about what are the options and open their minds to those possibilities. Absolutely. So um, for HR, a challenging time, but you sound someone quite excited by it um, and um, optimistic that, you know, we can work through the through these things with with the sort of work you've done perhaps this year with 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 your clients. What what would you say is are the kind of two or three largest areas that you've had to had to work with in in terms that affect um, the sort of flexible working kind of side of things? I think there's been a lot of work taking one step back a wee bit on um, people's employment brand and their employee value proposition. What it was it what's it going to take to attract the people we need. And that then builds up into the three or four things that are really coming out in all surveys and all research that I've read uh, around about um, getting the compensation and reward about right. It's never perfect, um, but you need to get it about right. And thinking differently about reward, maybe different remuneration models. Um, some of the more innovative companies in New Zealand and overseas have uh, developed different REM structures. Uh, for example, um, at the contribution model uh, framing around how you reward contribution as opposed to, uh, say, an old job evaluation model. Um, then that's so getting that whole reward model right. The second one is around flexibility and being more dynamic around flexibility and what that really means, and whether that's things around um, flexibility around early retirement and working people into retirement because the aging population issue organisations are finding. Uh, I was with um, some medical people the other day who were saying the average age of a GP is something like 55. Now, I don't know whether that's true or not, but that's quite scary. And I'm sure that's similar to uh, numbers in other sectors. So how do you work through that? What's this issue, you know, bringing back older people into the workforce who may need to work or may want to carry on working? What's your plan around that? What about um, internal mobility models? What are you thinking about keeping the talent you've got, but giving them opportunities and some tech that helps out with that, plus different models around uh, internal talent place, marketplaces. Uh, thinking around about uh, re returnships, which is something coming out of the US. So um, how do you how do you get your boomerang employees back engaged? You know, so different sourcing techniques. So that's if the, the broader flexibility model, um, job sharing. I've been in situations where I've had people work for me in job shares. If you get the right people, it's an outstanding opportunity and option. You get great, talented people who want to work in that model. Um, so that flexibility, broad flexibility. And then um, I think it's that whole framing around what development opportunities are you providing your staff. So constantly those three or four things come up regularly in a 
in the in the research I've read, you know, globally and in New Zealand around what employees are now wanting. Uh, I, I think that's that's really interesting reflection there because I, I look at similar surveys and definitely noticing that piece around total rewards, but it goes to you know thinking beyond just the the salary figure type. What what else can go into that? I see that piece coming up around flexibility and. Uh, I knew I'd get something like pr- pr- from you like this. The return ship, that's a new one for me. I, I like the idea of, of thinking about that, that whole boomerang kind mm. of piece. And what do you do to keep in touch with people that have left to maybe they come back? Um, and that whole piece that seems to be around de- helping people to develop their skills and do do th- do things do things better and advance themselves within their current role and, and current organisation. Um, and... Um, you know, I'm I'm struck um, how how many organisations are starting to recognise that they do need to update their employee value proposition. They do need to look at it kind of more rigorously and bring it to life for people and make sure that the promise they make to recruits is the promise that they deliver when when people are employed. So um, I think those are, are fascinating areas to be working on, really important areas to, to be to be working on. Um, to, you know, you mentioned one, one thing. One thing in there, which um, uh, I, I, I personally find find very interesting, and, and I've seen it. I've seen it work, uh, but it's it's not used that much. And that's that job share mm. model that you, you mentioned there. But t- tell me how you how organisations can make that work. Yeah, look, it's not without issues. Uh, again, uh, <laughs> having done it a couple of times, um, if the personalities of the two individuals say in a, in a normal job share don't necessarily connect. Um, that can be a problem. Mm. Um, it can add a bit of cost because there might be a model where you, and it's certainly in my experience, we we had a day of, of handover where both um, of the team members come in and, and so there was an extra one day cost to it. But the benefits from the examples I've been uh, used to are outstanding. Um, one of the organisations I work with in Australia, we promoted that quite uh, frequently and we got some incredible people in, uh, in the organisation. Um, and I just sat back and watched the wonderment that came from them because they just worked together really well and they drove so much value that the, the extra day cost in that model dissipated in terms of value. Right. So the value created. So this is two people. Two, essentially... people, two brains, two different thought processes, two styles, and you get the best of both. It's brilliant. Right. So that's, that's another thing that perhaps for our members to kind of be thinking about in terms of that perhaps opens up a talent pool yep. for them, um, that it gives them uh, additional costs potentially in the outset. But you're saying that what they get back at the end is, is going to be really worthwhile. That's certainly the experience over a couple of years of, of, of playing around with job sharing and, and, and organisations I've been in. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm intrigued by that. That's got me thinking about sort of any other sort of novel or interesting things that you've come across in the last couple of years, or or things that you've come across in the past. You think, oh, I'm surprised that hasn't that doesn't happen more now. Yeah, uh, a tech company I, I work with. Um, it's a bit easier for what they do, uh, understandably, but they have got a, a more or less a follow the sun model where they've got talent working 24 seven um in their model um across the different time zones uh so that gives great value to them because they've got people cutting code or doing uh, promotions and marketing and, and sales activities uh, over over that time frame so again thinking how do you leverage off uh the time zones that we we live within to bring talent in to fill the gaps between the uh the other hours we're not working in it from a New Zealand perspective. Right. And again, I guess widening the ta- talent pool. So are, are these people, these digital nomads that I hear of? Is, <laughs> is that what we're talking about there? No, no. They, they, these are these are situated in different countries, um, you know, domiciled there. Um, but the digital nomad piece, uh, I read something, uh, you know, a number of them, a uh, number of countries have opened up the digital nomad uh, visa, which we don't have in New Zealand, but other countries have opened it up. Portugal is a very good example. And people just go and live there for a period of time um, and, and live, live and work there on a visa. Uh, one of the consulting firms I do work for have opened that model up as well. So they're enabling their staff to work in their, their overseas offices for a period of time uh, and do still do the work for the New Zealand enterprise. Right. So that would open up that opportunity for 
um, I guess, those people that weren't able to do their OE over the last few years to kind of take their job with them and have the, the OE experience. Yeah, and even for a short period of time, even if it's a three-month period of time, there's countries have listed where you can go and work for there for, for a shorter period of time rather than the traditional two to three to four-year OE experience. So, you know, that's that's the kind of thinking um, that's going on out there, and I, and I love it because it gives gives people different opportunities at age and stages. Um, you know, as you can tell by my age, I, you know, maybe it's a time for I could go and be a digital nomad um, working in a different country and it won't matter to my clients. Yeah. So what I'm detecting is you're working with some organizations that are now proactively, positively thinking about what do we do in terms of flexibility and flexing our workforce, using workforce in different ways, accessing different kind of ta- talent pools. And that, that seems very positive. But I guess there's still some people that are playing catch up with that. They knee jerked into some sort of arrangements sort of post January 2020 and are perhaps trying to kind of come out of those at the moment. What sort of experience do you have of that with helping people to undo or work out what, what they're going to do from here? Yeah, look, it's certainly some, uh, I can understand why people would want to go back to the previous model. And I'm just, you know, my challenge to them is to think what were the benefits of uh, an unplanned um, uh, remote working experiment and did it make the staff happier, more productive? You read stuff that says it did, but what was your situation? So put it into your context. Obviously, for those organisations that need people to be on site to do, you know, manufacturing activities or the likes, that that's that's a no-brainer. You know, you've got to have people there doing that kind of work. But for others, what other ways, you know, what did you learn from that? What worked well? How will that help you attract and retain the right people um, going forward? So be proactive about it. I think some of the, the blockers can be some thinking around how you might reward people, some of the old systems that we've been used to. Uh, rightly or wrongly, we're assumed to be, I've got, you know, more people working, therefore I, I, I get paid more. So what are the, the mechanisms that are, that are restricting that thinking? You know, what are the, 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 the things that we've done normally that are constraining that? Is it your way that your employment contracts are crafted? Yes. It, it, is it um, the training that you offer only uh, face-to-face training in schools uh, opportunities? So do you need to move things differently? So all those elements you need to think through. But I would encourage people to kind of, you know, because I just see the the change happening and more and more employees are asking for it or demanding it back to our earlier conversation. Very good. So sort of challenging that thinking, helping them thinking through that. And, you know, I, I read research like, like you and uh, I read different things about, you know, does sort of hybrid working, flex working lead to greater productivity? And you give, give me some great anecdotes around the, the job share leading to mm. great, greater productivity. Um, what I, I, I wonder on it is, what are, the, are there any sort of guidelines that we can give to people to say, if, if you really want to make sure hybrid working or flexible working is productive, what are the things you need to do to kind of make sure that you accrue those benefits uh, and don't get some, some disbenefits from it? Yeah, I guess it's adapting to some more output, outcome-focused measures of success mm-hmm. and thinking about what's actually achieved and, 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 and measuring that uh, element. Uh, obviously, there's the classic kind of employee engagement uh, kind of data that you might or might not do, but just thinking around, are people happier? Are they feeling more productive? Uh, overlaying some of the cultural side of things, is it better for your culture or worse? Thinking about that because sometimes it can be detrimental to the culture in terms of collaboration, as we referred to earlier on. Um, I would, uh, you know, I'm not at all uh, into the things that are going on in the states in terms of uh, uh, measuring keystrokes and filming people and all that kind of employee um, monitoring that potentially is taking part a pay and in, in measuring emails and stuff like that that can be a wee bit kind of not 100 percent sure about that yeah 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 but, but again um you know there's some research from Microsoft during the co- uh, the COVID period which came out and that did look at um, global email trails and opening rates and responses and stuff in it it concluded pretty much that you know there was an improvement in in elements of productivity across their clients, you know, at, a, at an aggregate level. So you know there are ways you can use some of that if you just you know open up to your employees that you are going to look at this stuff. 
around uh, um, your, your digital footprint, around emails opening and you know, activity online to prove that it is more beneficial. But again, you know, outcome-based metrics, uh, uh, you know, ones that I think people need to look at. Yeah, so you seem to be someone that would guide people perhaps away from um, monitoring activity from a kind of surveillance kind of oh, point, yeah. point of view yeah. to more a kind of trust yeah. and focus on outputs kind yeah. of kind of model. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I mean that's hard uh, for some some organisations and some sectors, but you know, I find it a bit creepy at times myself. So yeah. yeah. Have Have you noticed any 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 sectors that are particularly challenged at the at the moment? Um, you know, per- personally, I've noticed that in things like uh, in, in areas like retail or hospitality, where you've got the situation where perhaps some jobs can be done in a kind of hybrid way. Uh, typically in retail, it would be support office, head office, but other roles clearly can't be done in that way. And and sort of navigating that sort of situation, uh, what industries have, have particular challenges from your point of view? Oh, you've hit the nail on the head in terms of retail, hospitality. Uh, they're, you know, they're incredibly difficult. People expect to walk into a store and get support if they, you know, can't find the right shoe size or clothing range or or what have you. Uh, hospo, you know, you want to drink at the bar or food served, you're going to have to rely on on people. So absolutely, um, there's those sectors. Agri is another one where, you know, on-farm activity has to be done by people driving a tractor or delivering uh, services. So there's, there's a number of sectors where it is so much more difficult to be flexible. But I think it's a mindset around what flexibility means. It's not that work from home model all the time. Is it different schedules? Is it um, uh, different rosters, uh, different opening times? Those kind of, you know, models that maybe think, you know, broadly around how can we get the, the work done, but differently. Yeah. So you're focusing very much on the work being done, uh, thinking about the way and how people do that work as a way of attracting people, engaging people, getting getting more productivity in the business. Um, so sort of ask, asking those sort of very fundamental questions mm. that it takes, takes us back to, it seems. Yeah, and I think you know, workforce planning and thinking ahead is something that, from my experience, I've been pretty poor at, to be honest, and, and a lot of organisations are. So maybe it's going back to some of the fundamentals of, you know, when do we when do we need that work done? How do we need it done? You know, to the five why kind of questioning why 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 stuff. You know, just really examining um, uh, the, the 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 old assumptions that we made, you know, pre COVID, and is it a time to to rethink those now? And and um, it's a great opportunity potentially because uh, we're under so much pressure from a talent perspective. But for some sectors, as you referred to, there's no easy answer because yes. they do need those people to serve the drinks and food and and, and look after the customers uh, face to face. Okay. So I'm thinking now, let's think ahead. And I'm thinking, you know, there's these, these changes in, in the workplace and the way work's done and the way we look at outputs, the way we think of jobs. What are the trends that are going to stay? You know, if we were thinking in 10 years' time, you know, and we look back and we say, these were the two or three things that really changed in the early 20s. What, what do you think they're going to be? Uh, look, I, I don't think there's going to be a change in the way that we need to connect as humans. You know, I think that's critical to any organisation. So how we engage um people, how we organize uh, ourselves around work. Um, you know, we the, the fundamental um, belief that an that a, a organization is full of people and getting those um, the right people doing the right things is not going to change. You know, we just need that done. And, and some of the beauty of working in a great organization is that connection and the, and the right culture and the excitement that work can create as opposed to a dreary situation. So I don't think that's going to change, but I do think the way that is uh, operated, you know, the, the global mindset, the different um, frames that we've talked about, I think that's going to change. So how we deal with work, that um, that the experience that we have in the job is going to change quite a bit, and especially as our demographics change um, in, in terms of the ageing population, 
uh, the immigration changes, um, you know, declining birth rates in many of our uh, advanced com- countries around the world, you know, take Japan uh, versus, say, parts of Africa, Nigeria, uh, you know, we're going to have to adapt to that, uh, to those kind of more global um, themes as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the, some interesting things around demographics and, and thinking about this in a, in a global way and thinking what's going on. So I just, I just wonder, you know, in terms of these sort of changes in terms of working patterns, what's what's been the sort of most interesting thing that you you've seen happen so far? The most interesting thing that an organisation has done, um, you've thought, oh, that's a bit different from what I've seen before, or uh, that's unusual. Uh, probably the better leveraging of the technology mm. that's available to them in thinking how to use, you know, whether it's the Zooms or the Teams or the Googles, you know, pick one. Uh, and the technologies that are available and making it work for that organisation um, and learning to make it work. I think that's been one of the more exciting things to see that at last people are seeing some of the benefits of that investment. Um, I, I think uh, some of the ability to collaborate in different fr- ways is, is is really, really good. And some of the ideas that are coming out because people are thinking differently, have more time to think at times. You know, hopefully that'll that'll um, you know be something that'll be seen in five or ten years' time as something that was that was positive out of this um, you know difficult and challenging times. Um, hopefully, seeing the broader talent that's out there, so that that that, that even in the in the current environment that you've got in your workplace, you know, thinking differently around those people, having seen them operate in a different way, maybe you've you know seeing that they're actually great people to keep. Um, and, and, and maybe looking better at what you've got versus always thinking something shiny and new is outside. So, yeah, thinking differently around about your own people. Yeah, so I, I, I hear a lot of optimism, really, in, in, what, in what you're saying. So sort of lots of, you know, tensions and uh, challenges at the moment, and uh, um, but a lot of optimism around um, how we can do, do things better, find talented uh, people, and just thinking about about things differently. There's a whole sort of rethink going on there around a- HR. It sounds like yeah, and I think uh, you read so much now about getting back to the the purpose and the mission, um, that sense of belonging um, to an organisation, and, and and creating that, and that captures a whole lot of raft of things like diversity and inclusion, and how. The organisation of the future is going to grapple with those kind of things. Um, so, look, I am pretty optimistic. I, I, I look at, at the the uh, COVID vaccine and putting that in context of how long vaccinations in the past have taken to develop. Yet that one took a pretty, you know, like a year or so, under a year to develop. And you go, if humans can gather together to solve a problem like that at a global level, why can't we do the same thing to solve our local problems? That's a that's a fantastic analogy. I I really like that, and it's it's very pertinent, obviously, because mm. it's that's the timing that it's happened on as well, isn't it? Around, you know, coming up with a vaccine in double quick time, and and coming up with these solutions in the workplace in in, in really really sort of quick time, and making sure that they they stick. Um, so that's that's a really nice sort of reflection. So, um, what what I what I've heard from you today is very much around, um, sort of. The idea that it, the best organisations are kind of challenging the way they they thought in the past, rethinking what 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 they're going to do, focusing on productivity, and considering a whole different range of sort of sort of working patterns, um, but always with the view to do these actually help my organisation to be more more effective, and as a first step on that, bring people in. Second step, keep them engaged, productive, and and third, thirdly, um, we're even into the returnship piece and making mm. sure that if they do leave, that they they come back. Yeah, and and, and I think it's that people centric focus. Is I think the the lessons of the last couple of years is how critical people are to. Uh, the way we operate, the way we organise our lives, organisations, and that people first mindset. You know that language has. You know, I, don't know, I haven't done a Google search on it, but I'm sure if you put in people first kind of mind, it, the the numbers of kind of people searching for that term has increased um, exponentially over the last few years. So it is around about that people first um, framing as well. Right. Yeah, very good. So sort of any final thoughts in terms of sort of, you know, one thing that you would really make sure that any HR manager has has in mind at the moment when they're thinking of the challenges of, of sort of flexibility in the workforce at the moment? 
My, my advice would be to look out as much as you look in and, and think about what's going on around you as much as, you know, uh, you're obviously um, focused very much on your organisation, um, but take a bit of time to take an outside in view to what's happening in the world and what ideas may be applicable to your organisation and the culture and the way you operate. Not all these ideas are going to work for every organisation, but what works for you? And you'll know that uh, as a seasoned professional about, hey, that's a great idea. Um, I read about that, heard about that, spoke to somebody else about that. We're going to pluck that, frame it a wee bit differently, put it in our language, but make it work. So I think it's that thinking outside about what's going on there because there's plenty of ideas out there and, and um, lots of people are looking for the same solutions uh, um, as you are probably. So take a look outside. Wonderful. Okay, so very much so looking outside, looking looking what other people have done, looking what worked, didn't work, but always bringing it back to what's going to work in my organisation. Absolutely, you have to yeah. adapt it. Um, it's not a cookie cutter approach to some of this stuff. You can't just cut and paste stuff and say that'll work in our organisation. You've got to overlay the culture, the leadership style, or the leadership capability uh, and, and, and adapt it to your situation. Thanks. And thanks very much for this this over, uh, overall conversation. It's been really very interesting and lots of sort of fascinating areas that we, we've touched on and delved into, you know, covering technology, uh, covering productivity, covering people that are in the organisation, outside outside the organisation. Um, so I'd like to thank you very much for sharing that that with us. I think that's been re really sort of valuable. Um, and what what we what we will do is we will have further discussions with with other 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 experts. We'll continue to examine these and to help you find the answers right for your organisations.